Supporting the NAD. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the April 8th uh, Chaos Value Working Meeting. Please add yourself and tell us how you're feeling or anything you want to share. And then the topic for today is like we have three metrics that we started in the last meeting. One was uh, organizational influence. Maybe I put the link in the chat. Yeah, this is the one uh, we worked last time. So I think it is a good time to maybe we finalize this one. Or any other thoughts or any other inputs? Should we take a few minutes just to take a look at it? Hi, Stephen. I always have to like, I always have to like get my head back into sure. what we're looking at. I've posted the minutes in the chat to Stephen uh, since you have joined now. So. Yep, I am adding myself. Thank you. I see somebody has cleaned this metric, but there is still one comment. I don't know why it was left and who has cleaned and who has left this. I don't know. Add for an outsider. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. when we are working on this metric organizational influence. It's come up a lot in class the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> As the students do their community architecture analysis assignments. Hmm, interesting. How many how many of things like these uh, since they're game students, the the UNICEF or the, the the Microsoft Visual Studio website version, you know, how these things are actually open but not really open to external contributions. So I don't know how you're open and not open to external contributions, but I, I guess you can say you are. <laughs> Hello, uh, could someone share the document with me? Sure. Um, Yeah, so I think we have to take a look at this implementation part. The description and objectives read pretty well to me. I think they're pretty clear. Can you share the uh, the main document as well? Uh, I have posted, Kevin. Ah, thank you. Welcome. It still looks like it's not looks like it's still rooted in share of voice. The social media and spread part of it or just this whole thing just the implementation part it doesn't look like we really clean that up so I, the question yeah. would be like how, how do we determine <clears throat> excuse me how do we determine um organizational influence and maybe sean and steven steven if your students are doing this i'd be curious as to what they're looking at and sean i think you've done this before too so if you can capture some of that. Let me see here. I mean, it's a function of how many organizations are contributing at a high rate 
and how many organizations have seat on the technical steering committee. Those are the two ways that at least larger open source projects have influence exercised by organizations. Yeah, I was going to mm -hmm. say the, the number of organizational employees in a project mm -hmm. is, is one way. Level of contribution from those uh, people. And then we discussed briefly last time how much say does one particular organization or group of organizations have over the direction of the project. And that's where the technical steering committee seats at the table become a factor. Because I think the TSCs largely exist to ensure that organizations who contribute a lot of human resources have a role in determining what we what the project does and does not do. And, and again, this is especially for larger projects. So hey, I, I've been I, jotting some of these down. Go ahead, Stephen, sorry. I, I dropped the assignment into the... Um, mm -hmm. In the chat. So, in addition to having them run Cauldron, um, they run the Callaway coefficient of fail, and they do a lot of diving into what's the IRC channel and where it's the source code repository. Um, what is the Callaway coefficient of fail? <laughs> oh, the Callaway coefficient of fail is a is a venerable blog post. Uh, by um, by Tom Calloway, formerly of Red Hat, now of AWS. Oh, I know Tom. Yeah. So this is, I mean, this is. It's it's like Tom to have a coefficient named after him. It's it's, 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 you could it's accuse people of having a high <laughs> a high Calloway coefficient of fail. <laughs> if yes, you want to yes, like um, put somebody it's, down. It's, is he the, it's, is, it's is he the one that named. Oh, sorry, it, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's in part tongue in cheek, but there's value in it. I mean, especially the students who are just trying to wrap their heads around um, what open source is and how open source communities work and stuff like that. Um, I mean, a lot of what they do is is not You know, it doesn't start and stop with things like cauldron. You know, we, we make them really analyze, you know, things like who's, who's really running it this semester because um, we're using um, working in public by egg ball. We're also looking at, you know, are these are these stadiums or federations or, or clubs or toys in terms of how the the size of audience versus size of contributors is. I don't know how many of you have looked at that yet. Um, so how does this coefficient of fail connect to organizational influence in your mind? Because um, a lot of these so, things I'm looking at are kind of like normal things that a project would do or not do. Right, so some of the things they're finding, some of these corporate projects um, are almost just, in terms of how many external contributions they actually accept, right? That almost all the contributions um, that get merged are made from the internal core team and uh, um, very little <clears throat> gets made by anybody outside. Twitter Bootstrap had that profile in the back yeah, of the day. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar projects. It's stuff like that's in Unity or like I said, the. Um, Whatever whatever the official name is for the entirely web driven version of Microsoft Studio Visual Studio is like a lot of these things that say they're they're open projects, but in fact the corporate core team does most of the work and rarely, if ever, takes anything from the outside. Okay, I got that jotted down. So Sean, is this, are, are you in that document? Mm -hmm. The 
is that list looking kind of like things that you were talking about too? Yeah, it's the actual, I mean, it's just, it's an LF thing, but they call it the technical steering committee. That's where a lot of decisions seem to be made, at least on the larger LF projects that I've participated in studying. It's a, it really is like a council of, it's a council of elders, um, but it's also a council of uh, organizations that have invested a certain obvious amount of resources. You know, there's not specified how many usually, but it's clear which organizations uh, are contributing a lot. And those, those organizations usually get a seat on the TSC. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm getting involved with one that's just spinning up, the 3D engine game engine one that's just spinning up. So they're supposed to do a soft launch any day now and a, a formal launch in July. Um, so it's, it'll, it'll be interesting to watch how that one comes together in terms of its administrative board because it's a lot of these organizations that are going to be participants in it. Like is, Uni is Unity involved? Um, I have been told, I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I never said this officially, but it will be public soon enough, is... This is Amazon moving their lumberyard engine, which is a, a, a fork and or a collaboration with uh, Ritec on their okay. engine over the years. And that's getting dropped into the foundation. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of, you know, so we've been told that there are actually people like, you know, folks from Unity and Epic who want in even though they're competitors right so well they're not open either well i mean all of these things are like so, so you can you can contribute the code to the unreal but you know it's it's run centrally right? yeah so it's, it's it's again one of these things you know core of elders or core of corporate masters right yeah you know so it's They'll take stuff from outside, but they, they're driving the direction. Whereas in theory, once what's currently being called open 3D engine for want of a better better name, right? That'll be steered by a standard LF kind of structure. Hmm. So it's gonna be interesting to watch. Uh, reading Elizabeth's comment on the contributor, uh, it feels like we really need to have a glossary of terms. Uh, like in chaos, we have reached a point where one terminology has been used in the different places in a different context. So maybe it's a good time to start a glossary of terms we use in the chaos. Well, contributor and maintainer. Let's not get carried away. That that's been def we defined this metric already, so. It's in the yeah. Just a uh, like suggestion for the open community meeting, which I just dropped a link into. So, Sean, there's an outstanding question I think on one of the things that you had said. Uh -huh. You were just talking, talking smoothly here, but on the second one, contributing at a high rate. Elizabeth had dropped that in. Like, what, what might that mean to you? I is think it like for the TSC, I think it still falls back to code. Like, they're not looking. You don't get on the TSC if you're a big issue creator, but you don't contribute code. There, the people on the TSC are generally writing code or leading people who write code. So, any other kinds of contributions are incidental, typically. So what does high rate mean? I think that's the question. Um, well, it's all relative, but there's, if you look at the commit records and organizational affiliations of any projects, some one to N organizations are gonna look like they're working hard on different parts of this. And if it's a 3D engine, then it's a large system. Um, 
and and those there's going to be like a, a, a high, it'll be the reverse of a hockey stick it'll be more like a poison distribution where you'll have a few at the top and then many many more at the bottom or in the case of something like twitter bootstrap you'll just have the people these are the orgs that are running it and thank you for your pull request no thank you is the typical response so it's you know there's different ways that control can be exerted more influence can be exerted in a project one, one of them is having some mass that justifies to the community that you would have a seat at the PSC organizationally the other is simply to have one organization like Twitter that controlled Bootstrap, who their, their internal development team kept a tight lid on who made contributions and rarely allowed somebody who wasn't in that core maintainer group uh, to make a contribution. Um, and then there are more democratic kinds of approaches where influence can still be a factor. Um, when I, I'm trying to think of, um, so can I, can I, can yeah. I like, so I'm just trying to get like what high rate <laughs> means. So like, yeah, is it, well, it's relative. It, it depends. I, I understand, but we use it. Should we get rid of the term? Like you had said it. Um, so is it like, do we need to explain what high rate means? I can is, do we, Kevin put something in there too. Or something. Yeah. Just some, something that might orient a reader of this metric. And I, I agree that it's all relative. But like what are, are contributing change requests that um, uh, uh, I'm think, I'm trying to think of a statistical word to explain it, but like there's topic. Within a I would say within a, uh, at a rate within a, within a one standard deviation or less of other high contributing organizations. So there's like a cut line that's pretty obvious in a lot of these projects where organizations, you know, maybe it's four, maybe it's one, maybe it's 11. You know, I don't know how many there are in Kubernetes, but I would imagine that there are organizations contributing at a high rate of change to different parts of Kubernetes. And so they might, but Kubernetes has multiple TSCs. So people might get seats at the TSCs where they're making the greatest contributions. Um, and technically there's some justification for this because you want the people making the directional decisions to be people who are deeply familiar with the code to some extent. So there's there's two things. There's influence derived from governance leadership on something that is a TSC or like a TSC. And then there's influence that's earned through uh, making making contributions over time. I mean, does, you know, you know I you, guess I guess this is a, a non automated piece of analysis, but I mean, a lot of these, um, you know, in a lot of the docs for a lot of the projects, it may be, you know, some of them publish paths into how you get to go from like contributor to maintainer to those kinds of things, right? You know, and right. But I, I don't think there's anything near standard enough where you could just, I don't think anybody said, you know, once you've had 15, 15, you know, issues, commits, merged, now now you're a maintainer, right? There's no way to just kind of parse that and say, you know, no. there it is, right? You know, so. I agree. I don't know this, but I think there could also be cases where organizations, um, their level within the LF in terms of how much contribution they make can play a role towards those organizations being able to say that they would like to be on the TSC of these projects. Well, I mean, I know in the, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but in the slide deck they were passing around for this open 3D engine, you know, when, it, when they're talking about the various seats on the various boards, you know, yeah. some of them are, you know, there's a, there's a certain pay to play aspect, right? Right. You know, you know, associate members don't get to sit on these committees because they haven't written a check, right? So there's that. 
um, or are only 20% are associate members or whatever. Um, I don't know if there's some kind of standard LF. <clears throat> so there's a- they decide that. So there are, maybe if you wanted to say this abstractly that you need to understand the influence dynamics within a project and then you can identify knowing that who the, who the most influential organizations are. And uh, I think Stephen's right, you know, there, are very, there are a lot of different ways that um, decisions about membership on something like a TSC or a maintainer list is uh, determined. It, it's, I think it's rather idiosyncratic. So this implementation wise becomes either a series of like uh, decision gates about what kind of organization it is and its size, or um, it could be a little narrative about these different ways of evaluating um, organizational influence in the context of a project. More than other metrics I've worked on, there's a lot of context that I need, that I would need to implement this for um, usefully because the signals aren't the same from every project. Um, so wait a minute, let's see here. I have a quick question. Um, when we were talked about adding a section in the metrics uh, just around limitations of it, like one limitation for this is if we're doing automated stuff and people are using their personal emails versus their organizational emails, yeah. it's hard to pull that out um, on GitHub. So I don't know if that's something we've, I feel like we've talked about it, but I don't, I don't remember. I don't recall, like, I think we've talked about it, but I don't recall ever talking about putting it into a metric as a, as a top level header or whatever, even a second level header. Yeah, so but I, it's a fair point. Here, here's the governing board structure that's proposed for the open 3D engine. Is that what was just based on our objectives? No. No, this or is. You put in a link. Okay. This is in their pitch doc. No, I, I didn't know if it belonged in their metrics or not. I, right, I know, probably not. Um, but if you board. feel right, at least this is a this is a current um, getting ready to open for business foundation document about how how governing boards and CSC and other seats occur. Should we not record this part? <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, I think I don't think this is novel to the three D engine. No, no, and I don't, I don't. You know, they're they're passing this around to interested players, and yeah. we, I mean, this is the wizard. Nobody, of Oz nobody told me not to share it. We were certainly, yeah. you know, urged not to send it to the press at the moment, right? But I don't think this is going to be hidden. I think this is just an early yeah. preview. This, this kind of sort of semi-deterministic structure for control is implicit in a lot of projects I work with that are large. I've never seen it stated so explicitly. It probably exists elsewhere with such explicitness, but this kind of removes the curtain from the Wizard of Oz uh, for how influence is exerted on large projects, especially or, on large or projects. Or under a, a large LF project, right? There's, right, yeah. A to play aspect at certain levels. Yeah. Yeah, like a um, like a contrasted Ruby on Rails with uh, Twitter Bootstrap, and I forget the third one in a paper on maybe eight years ago. And there was there's sort of the central control, there's the shared control, which is this third one, and then there's the very democratic control like Ruby on Rails had, and these, none of them are LF projects. But I, I don't think that those patterns are like a, those three high level patterns, I think are ways that organizations run. And the more resources that an organization has, the more likely they are to have this kind of deterministic or semi-deterministic structure because there's probably organizations giving money. Yeah, well, in, in this case, there's definitely organizations giving money, but it, it's also just the size 
of the project, right? They're they're right. trying they're trying to flip an industry here. They're they're trying to start off as a something with tentacles everywhere. They're not trying to start off as you know IPI. This is not a private project that eventually popularly grows to take over how things are done. This is like boom. We are we are trying to flip the games industry to open and. The games industry has a lot of players and it's a lot of money. Like that's, yeah. This this isn't just the games industry. They're they've got auto manufacturers in here. They've got architectural companies in here. It's um, it's about 3D engines writ large, not just games. But right. The tech coming out of games and a lot of the the interest is in games. So. Yeah. There's a lot of small players who need a little bit of this, but don't want to pay the price tag for something commercial. They'd rather have it be open and maintained and modifiable so you're not waiting three years for a feature you really need yeah i mean as long as you're open about it i don't think there's anything yeah wrong with this i, I no. Think. but anyway it's it's it it's a peek into how their thinking is these days for things that are start this big And, and if, I mean, if it's a board this big for a project this big, is it undue influence or is it just an acceptable level of influence? How do you figure that out? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how we get information like this out of GitHub repos anyway. It would take, you know, something, a, a human or something that reads, you know, wherever they've got their governance structure stuff published. Maybe okay, so you, yeah, you, Sean and Stephen were talking about many things there, so. <laughs> Are all of the, the bullet points inside of implementation capturing what you're talking about? That was a fairly wide ranging many things. Yeah. Well, I, and I think it's important. The key thing is that that wide ranging number of things emerges from just the nature of influence and in open source being complicated and diverse. Like, is that the metric that's complicated or complex? It's the nature of influence in open source. It's our challenge to represent that coherently. So, so from a metrics, try to narrow this in, right? Um, organizational, when, when, when you essentially have a product that, or a project that comes out of a, a web of organizations to begin with, then is this metric looking at organizational influence versus contributor influence, or is it breaking it down into which organizations have how much influence? Right, I mean, there's, there's the core team is Facebook, <laughs> right, for, for that particular project that I'm, of course, now blanking on because we started to talk about. What was what you were talking about before? Facebook what? Uh, talking about Twitter bootstrap, but there's also... Right, Twitter bootstrap, right. So but there's also I mean, there's, Facebook has something similar. I can't remember the name of right now. Right. So so if it's if it's Twitter bootstrap and it all comes from Twitter, that's one level right. of influence. If it's, you know, 10% from Unity and 10% from Epic and 10% from Microsoft and 10% from Amazon, right? That's... Are we looking at that kind of organizational influence? Or is it just like 
corporate organizations own 80% of this and random contributors own 20% of it. What's the, what's mm -hmm. the way the, the metric is analyzing that level of organizational numbers? I, mean, I think maybe both of those things. Yeah. I think it depends on the implementation. Like we are giving this as an uh, option to think like how you can use it. You can use it for one company to analyze how their contribution is, or as a maintainer of a project, they can look how many different companies are influencing it. or even a specific company interested in looking at how much they have influence on a particular project. So it's like from three different perspectives. Thank you, Vinod. That, that's what I was trying to say and doing a bad job of. <laughs> I think it's a good summary. I know this obviously is in value, but um, do, would this relate to anything that's going on in risk? Because I feel like it could be kind of risky if you have one, you know, all your eggs in one basket, and then the company decides, gets new leadership and decides, no, nope, we don't want to contribute anymore. Yeah, we've like, defined a metric for elephant factor, which is basically okay. if it's one organization. Perfect. Okay. That's what um, I was thinking. Yep. Yep. I think these complex organizational forms are when everybody sees the value of this and wants to, wants to be in on it. It's like almost a gold rush mentality. Like, how do I get my seats on the board? It's like watching a season of succession. <laughs> yeah. Team Shiv. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not honestly even sure what I'm doing in this group of people since I'm this kind of like lone academic guy amidst all of these. Um, you know, I'm an people. academic. Yeah. I'm not an academic. No, I, I, no, I meant, I meant in this, this open 3D engine thing is like, you know, I'm. I, well, I, I mean, the, the role that you have in it, I, I think, so I, I've done seven years of funded research with Games for Learning and Unity kind of owned the game um, when we entered that uh, 10 years ago. I, I think, and, and there was a Java, an Oracle project, a Java project that had a 3D virtual world that was, I can't remember what it was called, but th this has been an area of software that's been struggling for resources for a long time and, and dominated by closed source technology. So I think this is a, if you want to advance the use of this technology for science, for learning, this is the kind of thing you need, whatever this is going to be. Oh, from, from that point of view, I, 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 I agree mm -hmm. why I should be there. Why the guys from, from Amazon and LF have dropped me in here when it's mm -hmm. most major corporation effort is is mm -hmm. what's kind of interesting yeah because if this is accessible to undergraduates in their dorm room and they can figure it out you have you know you have something pretty powerful You know, they were, they're supposed to do the soft launch of this next month. They're trying to push it out to the game developers conference in mid July. So, so all of this stuff, I don't know if they're planning to do all of these governing board, et cetera, decisions and placement before the game developers conference or after.
it's, it's a good list and implementation. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of anything else at the moment. Nothing pops out to mind in terms of stuff that's missing. And then maybe we can think on data collection strategies, number of ways we can collect the data on this. Maintainer roles we can get from existing metrics. Um, level and types of contributions we can get from existing metrics. Are there other things on the agenda that we need to hit for this meeting, or are we just doing the, uh, this this today? Kevin's with the ten minute warning. I think the other things were <laughs> metrics. So we have two new metrics to, to start with, which is like uh, value organization bring to open source project and value organization drive from open source project. I don't think we have time to start this. Maybe we finish the influence and then focus on these two will be the best strategy I propose. Makes sense. And one thing I, yeah. So one thing I've added on the list is uh, participation in OSPOS. I think this came up in the uh, journal meeting also. But I feel like uh, value working group participation is very focused and in align with OSPO. So uh, any suggestion or we as a uh, chaos participating in general or like uh, from a value group, are we participating it is like what my proposal is. You say any general group, that? what do you mean? Uh, general in as a like chaos as a whole rather than a specific working Oh, general, group. okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, like uh, I'm, I'm willing to work on this. I can write a document as a like uh, proposal, and we have a different options to participate in. So just wanted the input because I feel like, especially the work we are doing on the organizational side is highly in line with the OS, uh, OSPO on. So. Yeah, have you, I'd say yes on this. I think that okay. post Corona, we need to start as a community as a whole, being a little bit more active in terms of where we're submitting. You know what I mean? Just because the last year was obviously pretty rough. Yeah. Now, OspoCon's still open. I just dumped all things open CFP into the chat as well. But like pre Corona, I mean, coming out of the Chaos Project, we would have like, uh, like for like 20 yeah. to 30 submissions. Yeah, at a variety of different conferences, and <laughs> obviously Corona put a halt to that. So it'd be great to find any way to start improving, or like getting back to what it was like a year ago. So Vinod, if you would like to take the lead on that, that'd be awesome. Yes, I'm happy, but uh, I'm looking for the suggestion. Like, should we go uh, for a full presentation or a lightning talk or a panel discussion? Any ideas? Personally, I think a full presentation is fine, but Stephen, I think you were gonna say something too. Um, I think there's room and I don't think it has to be either or. I, you know, when I, um, when I dropped the question in the do group, private channel about, um, about value, there was a lot of kind of, yeah, we all want to be able to do this and we all don't know how to do this. So I could, I could see a dual approach where there's a, there's a chaos talk, but there's also a panel. I just dropped a, there's like seven topics listed for suggested topics. And there's one that stuck out as related to our discussion. I put in chat. I mean, Dwayne from Dwayne from Indeed was one of the ones who was most engaged and willing to talk to me about value. So I could see a, a chaos mm -hmm. in the, maybe somebody from LF mm -hmm. panel talking about value as, as another offering. Okay, so I think I'll prepare something on this and then we'll share with the uh, and like with everyone and 
get the feedback. Ron, is, is that a title or a t-shirt? That's a suggested topic for the OSPOCON. So like on the websites, that's one of the suggested topics. And I think the discussion we just had of the suggested topics just fits really well under that one. Yeah. I hope Ireland gets its vaccine act together. I could really use a trip to Dublin. You and, me, you and me both, my friend. Yeah, you and me both. I, uh, Let me out of my attic. <laughs> uh, but I guess they've kept this OSPO as a, like both option, in-person and virtual too. Yeah. I don't know how they are going to like implement two things together. Yeah. Well, there's, the, you know, every, pretty much every conference is saying, you know, would you do this virtually? Would you do this in person? Would you do this both? Um, yeah. Open yeah. OpenSim is trying the same thing. They're trying to do two. Yeah, the ACM group is in January, end of January, twenty twenty two, and we just made a decision to go all in on an in person conference. Yeah, I think by that point, I'm I'm feeling. I'm feeling pretty good about September this year, but my friends in Ireland are like, well, we hope we're all vaccinated by then. So um, it's been Ireland. slow in Europe. Supply chain wise, I would suspect it's because the US has been so aggressive about purchasing the supply. Yep. Yeah, I also wouldn't uh, mind going to North Carolina after I go to Dublin. Yeah. I'm just going to drive to Omaha so I can leave my state. <laughs> so uh, we have two more things on the agenda. Uh, okay. One is like spring cleaning, anything. Uh, Lot and look, there are nothing in the pull request, but there are some issues. Uh, on the GitHub, so maybe we can look at it or... Are these related to the uh, repo standardization effort, Renan? Uh, not, uh, like one is on the standardization, but which is being worked, so there's nothing outstanding on that. It's just an open issue. But I see a one, uh, uh, two especially, like, uh, one is key performance indicator and adding a uh, capping value focus area. So maybe like we are at the end of, we have two minutes in the meeting. So maybe we keep it in the next meeting and add it to the priority. So yeah, bring something would, on those. I think um, academic value as a focus area would support some of the work that we're doing examining open source scientific software. So. I might change the word academic to scientific because it communicates something, but we can talk about it next time. Okay. Okay. So I'll keep it in the next time agenda. And the last thing is any issues or any other thing you want to discuss for upcoming meetings or any suggestions? Um, just uh, day and time haven't been announced yet, but I did get a, um, a birds of a feather proposal accepted by this conference. I don't know if any of you know it or not, but um, talking about academic value related stuff i.e how do we oh. how do we talk about and, and and credit people for their open work in an academic context so yeah one of our good friends Carthy graham is the organizer okay so i don't intend to come 
come to that with any answers. I come, plan to mostly try to get people in the room talking about what their thoughts are on. Mm -hmm. But that may and may address academic so, values. So finance it due, maybe we can bring this topic first in the next meeting and discuss the ideas for that. I think the I think the call for call for presentations is gone. It looks like. Yeah. It's May, yeah, May 4th I, and 5th. It's coming right up. Less yeah, but I'll month. I'll have that um I'll have that birds with a feather. That's the only thing that isn't set on that is which day and what time. Mm -hmm. But that discussion group will happen. So I can I, try to bring whatever we've been talking about in here to it and bring stuff back from it to this group. Yeah. And obviously I think it's free. So if the timing works, people who want to hop in and and add their two cents are more than welcome. It's May 4th and 5th. Yep. Yep. It does and, look as though and it is our next free. Meeting is on, uh, our next meeting is on. Next meeting is on the 22nd, right? Uh, our um, next. Uh, yes. So we can uh, brainstorm it a little bit and, and uh, help you out. So I'll bring it to the top in the next meeting. So we are at the end of the time. Uh, thank you all for your participation and support. Happy to be here. Okay. Yep. Goodbyes. All right, folks. See you in two. Hey, everybody. Bye, see you in a couple of weeks, see everyone. Take care. Bye.